Alright, hello everyone, welcome back. I'm your friend Insight. So, right, today we are going to go to a new level. Let's see where it should be. Uh, okay, so, um, according to this last, we know after the, after the high school geometry kind of stuff, we're gonna go to the algebra 2. So basically now we are in the middle of the whole learning nest. That was good. At least, uh, it proved, it, it, it is proved that we're still in learning. That's, that's great. So, for the first one, it is called, uh, Polynomial arithmetic. Polynomial arithmetic. All right, let's get into it. Let's explore the notion of a polynomial. So this seems like a very complicated word, but if you break it down, it'll start to make sense, especially when we start to see examples of polynomials. So the first part of this word, let me underline it. We have poly. This comes from Greek for many, and you see poly a lot in the English language, referring to the notion of many of something. So in this case, it's many nomials. And nomial comes from Latin, from the Latin nomen for name. So you could view this as many names, but in a mathematical context, it's really referring to many terms. And we're gonna talk in a little bit about what a term really is. But to get a tangible sense of what are polynomials and what are not polynomials, let me give you some examples, and then we could write some uh, maybe more formal rules for them. So an example of a polynomial could be 10x to the seventh power minus 9x squared plus 15x to the third plus nine. This is a polynomial. Another example of a polynomial, 9a squared minus five. Even if I just have one number, even if I were to just write the number six, that can officially be considered a polynomial. If I were to write seven x squared minus three, let me do it in another variable, seven y squared minus three y plus pi, that too would be a polynomial. So these are examples of polynomials. What are examples of things that are not polynomials? Well, if I were to replace the seventh power right over here with the negative seventh power, so if I were to write 10x to the negative seventh power minus 9x squared plus 15x to the third power plus nine, this would not be a polynomial. So I think you might be sensing a rule here for what makes something a polynomial, that you have to have non-negative powers of your variable in each of the terms. And I just use that word term, so let me explain it, because it'll help me explain what a polynomial is. A polynomial is something that is, a, that is made up of a sum of terms. And so, for example, in this first polynomial, the first term is 10x to the seventh, the second term is negative 9x squared, the next term is 15x to the third, and then the last term, maybe you could say the fourth term, is nine. And you can see something, let me underline these. So these are all, these are all terms. This is a four-term polynomial right over here. And you can say, hey, wait, this thing you wrote in red, this also has four terms. But we have to put a few more rules for it to officially be a polynomial, especially a polynomial in one variable. Each of those terms are going to be made up of a coefficient. This is the thing that multiplies the variable to some power. So in this first term, the coefficient is 10. And let me write this word down, coefficient. So another fancy word. But it's just a thing that's multiplied, in this case, times the variable, which is x to the seventh power. So the, co the first coefficient is 10. The next coefficient, and actually let me be careful here, because the second coefficient here is negative nine. So we are looking at coefficients. The third coefficient here is 15. And you can view this fourth term, or this fourth number, as the coefficient, because this could be rewritten as Instead of just writing as nine, you could write it as nine x to the zero power. And then it looks a little bit clearer like a coefficient. So in general, a polynomial is the sum of a finite number of terms where each term has a coefficient, which I could represent with the letter A, being multiplied by a variable, being raised to a non-negative integer power. So this, right over here is a coefficient. It can be, if we're dealing, well, I don't wanna get too technical. It could be a positive, negative number. It could be any real number. We have our variable. And then the exponent here has to be non-negative 
non-negative integer. So here, the reason why what I wrote in red is not a polynomial is because here I have an exponent that is a negative integer. Let's give some ex other examples of things that are not polynomials. So if I were to change the second one to, instead of 9a squared, if I wrote it as 9a to the 1 half power minus 5, this is not a polynomial because this exponent right over here, it is no longer an integer. It's 1 half. And this is the same thing as 9 times the square root of a minus 5. This also would not be a polynomial. Or if I were to write 9a to the a power minus 5, also not a polynomial because here the exponent is a variable. It's not a non-negative integer. So all of these are examples of polynomials. So there's a few more pieces of terminology that are valuable to know. Polynomials is a gen or a polynomial is a general term for one of these expressions that has multiple terms, a finite number, so not an infinite number, and each of the terms has this form. But there's more specific terms for when you have only one term or two terms or three terms. So when you have one term, it's called a monomial. So this is a monomial. This is an example of a monomial, which we could write as 6x to the 0. But you could also, another example of a monomial might be 10, 10 z to the 15th power. That's also a monomial. It, your coefficient could be pi. Pi, whoops, it could be pi. So we could write pi times, times b to the 5th power. Any of these would be monomials. So it's a binomial? Where binomials where you have two terms. Monomial, mono for one, one term. Binomial is you have two terms. So this right over here is a binomial. Binomial. You have two terms. And all of these are polynomials, but these are subclassifications. So it's binomial, you have one, two terms. Another example of a binomial would be would be three y to the third plus five y. Once again, you have two terms that have this form right over here. Now you'll also hear the term trinomial. Well, trinomial is when you have three terms. Trinomial. And this right over here is an example. This is the first term, this is the second term, and this is the third term. Now the next word that you will hear often in context with polynomials is the notion of the degree of a polynomial. And you might hear people say, what is the degree of a polynomial? or what is the degree of a given term of a polynomial. So let's start with the degree of a given term. So let's go to this polynomial over here. We have this first term, 10x to the seventh. The degree is the power that we're raising the variable to. So this is a seventh degree term. The second term is a second degree term. The third term is a third degree term. And you could view this constant term, which is really just nine, you could view that as, sometimes people will say the constant term, sometimes people will say the zeroth degree term. Now if people are talking about the degree of the entire polynomial, they're gonna say, well what is the degree of the highest term? Or what is the, the term with the highest degree? That degree will be the degree of the entire polynomial. So this first polynomial, this is a seventh degree polynomial. This one right over here, is a second degree polynomial because it has a second degree term and that's the highest degree term. This right over here is a third degree. You could even say third degree binomial because its highest degree term has degree three. If this said five y to the seventh instead of five y, well then it would be a seventh degree binomial. This right over here is a 15th degree monomial. This is a second degree trinomial. Now the last thing I will, or a, a few more things I will introduce you to, is the idea of a leading term and a leading coefficient. So let me write this down. The notion of what it means to be leading. Well it usually means, it can mean whatever is the first term or the coefficient. If you're saying leading term is the first term, and if you're saying leading coefficient is the coefficient in the first term, but it's oftentimes associated with a polynomial being written in standard form. So standard form, standard form, 
is where you write the terms in degree order, starting with the highest degree term. So for example, what I have up here, this is not in standard form, because I do have the highest degree term first, but then I should go to the next highest, which is the x to the third. But here I wrote x squared next. So this is not standard. If I wanted to write it in standard form, it would be 10x to the seventh power, which is the highest degree term, as the degree seven. Then 15x to the third, so plus 15x to the third, which is the next highest degree. Then negative nine x squared is the next highest degree term. And then the lowest degree term here is plus nine or plus nine x to zero. Now this is in standard form. I have written the terms in order of decreasing degree with the highest degree first. And here it's clear that your leading term is 10x to the seventh, because it's the first one. And our leading coefficient here is the number 10. So there was a lot in that video, but hopefully the, the notion of a polynomial isn't seeming too intimidating at this point. And these are really useful words to be familiar with as you continue on on your math journey. Uh, yeah, what he said is true. Uh, th those terminology are quite important for your math journey because if you don't know the meaning of those words, you will no longer be able to go on because those concepts are built on the previous concepts. Average, uh, average, average rate of change of polynomial. We are asked, what is the average rate of change of the function f, and this function is f up here, this is the definition of it, over the interval from negative two to three, and it's a closed interval because they put these brackets around it instead of parentheses, so that means it includes both of these boundaries. Pause this video and see if you can work through that. All right, now let's work through it together. So there's a couple of ways that we can conceptualize average rate of change of a function. One way to think about it is, it's our change in the value of our function divided by our change in x, or it's our change in the value of our function per x on average. You can view it as change in the value of function divided by your change in x. If you say that y is equal to f of x, you could also express it as change in y over change in x. On average, how much does a function change per unit change in x on average? And we could do this with a table, or we could try to conceptualize it visually. Let's just do this one with a table, and then we'll try to connect the dots a little bit with the visual. So if we have x here, and then if we have y is equal to f of x right over here, when x is equal to negative 2, what is y going to be equal to? Or what is f of negative 2? Well, let's see. f of, so y is equal to f of negative 2, which is going to be equal to negative 8. That's negative 2 to the third power. Minus 4 times negative 2, so that's minus negative 8. So that's plus 8. That equals 0. And then when x is equal to 3, I'm going to the right end of that interval. Well, now y is equal to f of of 3, which is equal to 27, 3 to the third power, minus 4 times 3, minus 12, which is equal to 15. So what is our change in y over our change in x over this interval? Well, our y went from 0 to 15, so we have an increase of 15 in y. And what was our change in x? Well, we went from negative 2 to positive 3, so we had a plus 5 change in x. So our change in x is plus 5. And so our average rate of change of y with respect to x, or the rate of change of our function with respect to x over the interval is going to be equal to 3. If you wanted to think about this visually, I could try to sketch this. So this is the x-axis, the y-axis, and our function does something like this. So at x equals negative 2, f of x is 0, and then it goes up, and then it comes back down, and then it does something like this. It does something like this, and it does, and it was going before this. And so the interval that we care about, we're going from negative 2 to 3, which is right about there. So that's x equals negative 2 to x equals 3. And so what we want to do at the left end of the interval, our function is equal to zero. So we're at this point right over here. I'll do this in a new color. We're at this point right over there. And at the right end of our function, f of three is 15. So we are up here someplace. Let me connect the curve a little bit. We are, we are going to be up there. And so when we're thinking about the average rate of change over this interval, we're really thinking about the slope of the line that connects these two points. So the line that connects these two points looks something, looks something like this. And we're just calculating what is our change in y, which is going to be this, our change in y, and we see that the value of our function increased by 15 divided by our change in x. So this right over here is our change in x, which we see we went from negative 2 to 3, that's going to be equal to 5. So that's all we're doing when we're thinking about the average rate of change. All right, that's a simple idea.
adding and subtracting polynomial. They're just basic kind of stuff, uh, right? So uh, let's say, what do we want to do? Uh, let's let's have a look at this one. Let's say that we wanted to multiply 5x squared and I'll do some purple 3x to the fifth. What would this equal? Pause this video and see if you can reason through that a little bit. All right, now let's work through this together. And really, all we're going to do is use properties of multiplication and use properties of exponents to essentially rewrite this expression. So we can just view this if we're just multiplying a bunch of things. It doesn't matter what order we multiply in this. So you could just view this as 5 times x squared times 3 times x to the fifth, or we could multiply our 5 and 3 first. So you could view this as 5 times 3 times 3 times x squared times x squared times x to the fifth times x to the fifth. And now what is 5 times 3? We know that. That is 15. Now what is x squared times x to the fifth? Now some of you might recognize that exponent properties would come into play here. If I'm multiplying two things like this, we have the same base and different exponents, that this is going to be equal to x to the, and we add these two exponents, x to the 2 plus 5 power or x to the 7th power. If what I just did seems counterintuitive to you, I'll just remind you. What is x squared? x squared is x times x. And what is x to the fifth? That is x times x times x times x times x. And if you multiply them all together, what do you get? Well, you got 7x's and you're multiplying them all together. That is x to the seventh. And so there you have it. 5x squared times 3x to the fifth is 15x to the seventh power. So the key is, is look at these coefficients. Look at these numbers, the 5 and the 3. Multiply those. And then for, for any variable you have, if you have x here, so you have a common base, then you can add those exponents. And what we just did is known as multiplying monomials, which sounds very fancy. But this is a monomial, monomial. And in the future, we'll do multiplying things like polynomials, where we have multiple of these things added together. But that's all it is, multiplying monomials. Let's do one more example, and let's use a different variable this time just to get some variety in there. Let's say we want to multiply the monomial 3t to the seventh power times another monomial, negative 4t. Pause this video and see if you can work through that. Uh, of course, I could have worked through it. It's just, uh, let's say, 3 times negative 4 would be next negative uh, 12. And 8 times, uh, since they have the count base of t, so we could say, uh, it times the t to the power of 8 because this is 7 and it is 1, 7 plus 1 equal to 8. And that's, that's, that's just as simple as you, you could master. Uh, so let's, uh, let's just get into uh, this video. Earlier in our mathematical adventures, we had expanded things like x plus y times x minus y. Just as a bit of review, this is going to be equal to x times x, which is x squared, plus x times negative y which is negative xy, plus y times x, which is plus xy, and then minus y times y, or you could say y times the negative y, which is going to be minus y squared, negative xy, positive xy, so this is just going to simplify to x squared minus y squared. And this is all a review. We covered it and when we thought about factoring things that are differences of squares. We thought about this when we were first learning to multiply binomials. And what we're going to do now is essentially just do the same thing, but do it with slightly more complicated expressions. And so another way of expressing what we just did is we could also write something like a plus b times a minus b is going to be equal to what? Well, it's going to be equal to a squared minus b squared. The only difference between what I did up here and what I did over here is instead of an x, I wrote an a. Instead of a y, I wrote a b. So given that, let's see if we can expand and then combine like terms for if I'm multiplying these two expressions. Say I'm multiplying 3 plus 5x to the fourth times 3 minus 5x to the 4th. Pause this video and see if you can work this out. All right, well, there's two ways to approach it. You could just approach it exactly the way that I approached it up here, but we already know that when we have this pattern where we have something plus something times that same original something minus the other something, well, that's going to be of the form of this thing squared minus this thing squared. And remember, the only reason why I'm applying that is I have a 3 right over here and here. So the 3 is playing the role of the A. So let me write that down. That is our A. And then the role of the B is being played by 5x to the 4th. So that is our B right over there. So this is going to be equal to A squared minus B squared. But our A is 3. So it's going to be equal to 3 squared minus, and then our B is 5x to the 4th, minus 5x to the 4th squared. Now what does all of this say? 
simplify to? Well, this is going to be equal to 3 squared is 9, and then minus 5x to the 4th squared. Let's see, 5 squared is 25, and then x to the 4th squared. Well, that is just going to be x to the 4th times x to the 4th, which is just x to the 8th. Another way to think about it are exponent properties. We are, This is the same thing as 5 squared times x to the 4th squared. If I raise them to an exponent and then raise that to another exponent, I multiply the exponents. And there you have it. Let's do another example. Let's say that I were to ask you, All right, um, what is 3... Th th this this is also quite simple, I guess. Um, for many of you, if you are coming from China, you probably did this a lot in your classroom. Um, all right, let's say let's say one more video, and we will end this video. What we're going to do in this video is practice squaring binomials, and this is something that we've done in the past, but we're going to do it with slightly more involved expressions. But let's just start with a little bit of review. If I were to ask you what is a plus b squared, what would that be? Pause the video and try to figure it out. Well, some of you might immediately know what a binomial like this squared is, but I'll work it out. So this is the same thing as a plus b times a plus b, and then we could multiply this a times that a, so that's going to give us a squared, and then I can multiply that a times that b, and that's going to give us a b. Then I could multiply this b times that a. I could write that as b a or a b. So I'll just write it as a b again. And then I multiply this b times that b. So plus b squared. And what I really just did is apply the distributive property twice. We go in, into a lot of detail in previous videos. Some people also like to call it the FOIL method. Either way, this should all be a review. If it's not, I encourage you to look at those introductory videos. But this is going to simplify to a squared plus we have an a b and another a b. So you add those together, you get 2 a b plus b squared. Squared. Now, why did I go through this review? Well, now we can use this idea that a plus b squared is equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared to tackle things that at least look a little bit more involved. So if I were to ask... Um, sometimes you, you would think why they want to add the two powers to the base of a plus b. Why don't they just uh, calculate out the a plus b value? Then uh, they, they'll just have to do the power to a single number base. That would be more simplified. Why they don't do that? Well, because in reality, if you model some math problem or if you model some problem with the uh, mathematics expression, you will often find that you get some unknown variable. For example, here the a and b. Since they are unknown, you, you can not just add them together to get a real value, single value. But still, you want to uh, do something with it. So in this case, you have no choice but write down the a and b. Then you, you, you somehow compose a very complicated expression. That's probably where the algebra, the whole class, comes, comes from, since we got some unknown variables. You, what is 5x to the 6 plus 4 squared? Pause this video and try to figure it out and try to keep this and this in mind. Well, there's several ways you could approach this. You could just expand this out the way we just did, or you could recognize this pattern that we just established. That if I have an a plus b and i squared, it's going to be this. And so what you might notice is the role of a is being played by 5x to the 6th right over there, and the role of b is being played by 4 right over there. So we could say, hey, this is going to be equal to a squared. We have our a squared there. So what is a squared? Well, 5x to the 6th squared is going to be 25x to the 12th power. And then it's going to be plus 2 times a times b. So plus 2 times 5x to the 6th times 4. Actually, let me just write it out just so we don't confuse ourselves. 2 times 5x to the, I'll color code it, 2. 2 times 5x to the 6th times 4 times 4 plus b squared. So plus 4 squared. So that's going to be plus 16. And then we can simplify this. So this is going to be equal to 25 x to the 12. 2 times 5 times 4 is 40. 2 times 5 is 10 times 4 is 40. So plus 40 x to the 6 plus 16. Let's do another example. And I'll do this one even a little bit faster. Um, in general, you may have to, you know, work through a lot of examples to get the general ideas or to learn that kind of concept. But for me, I did that a lot in the past when I still in the school. So um, I don't need to do this anymore. I know what, what, what they are say and I basically master that kind of role. So um, this is today's video and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.